here. So thank you for joining this uh, Common Grounds meeting. Uh, we're just really excited about uh, all the great things that are happening. And we're really, really happy to have Mark Love and Greg Marutsky, uh today. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have them. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, for those of you that may not know them personally, I wanted to give little introductions as we uh, get started. But before we do that, I'm going to ask uh, Keith if he wouldn't mind to open us up in a prayer. I wouldn't mind. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you uh, giving you great thanks for this occasion for all times when we can celebrate the possibility of greater unity among your people. Lord, we, we know that Jesus prayed fervently for this, and we pray that you would help us uh, in all we do to realize that our our brotherhood is much, much larger than a lot of people suppose. And that as we seek to fellowship each other, God, we ask your blessing on, on all of our efforts to find common grounds and to find that common ground in Jesus and in his love and in his grace and your grace, Lord. We pray that you will be with us in our thinking, that you'll be with us in our loving of each other that you'll be with us in our sharing, that you'll help us in every way to seek a better way to read your word in the way that you want us to read it, that you would help us to overcome our various confirmation biases, that you'd help us to overcome our, our various uh, foundational errors. And I suspect that we have far more than we know. God help us in all we do that you may have the praise of your glorious grace heard in an ever widening circle. Be with our speaker today, be with us in our, in our discussions, help us in all things to move closer to your heart. We lift this up in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Well, we have um, Dr. Greg Moretzky with us and he is the evangelist for the Antelope Valley Church of Christ in Lancaster, California. Greg and Kathy have been married for 39 years, having met in high school. Mm -hmm. Greg became a Christian at the University of Colorado and graduated with a BS in civil engineering and a, and a BS in business administration. Greg worked as a civil engineer before he entered the full-time ministry, he continued his education at Pepperdine University, receiving an MS in ministry and a Master's of Divinity. Greg later gained a Doctor of Ministry degree from Abilene Christian University and an MS in Clinical Counseling from the University of Nebraska. Greg is currently pursuing a PhD in leadership from Johnson uh, University. Greg is the Dean of the Los Angeles School of Ministry, plus teaches at the Rocky Mountain School of Theology and Ministry. Greg teaches courses from de for dealing with anxiety and depression, as well as ministry courses. Greg is a national board certified counselor and a licensed professional clinical counselor and a licensed marriage and family therapist in California. Greg has been in the ministry for 40 years, uh, Greg and Kathy have two daughters, Amanda, married to Kyle, living in Orange County, and Megan, married to Chad, plus three grandchildren, Sienna, McKenna, and Dean, living in Dallas. And then we have Dr. Mark Loves, uh, Love, who served congregations in Texas and Oregon in the full-time ministry for 17 years before moving into a world of academia. He consults with congregations across the United States who are interested in cultivating a missional identity. Mark currently serves as a director, graduate school of religion, masters of religious education, missional leadership at Rochester University. He previously served as the assistant professor of ministry, um, graduate school of theology at Abilene Christian University. Mark holds a PhD from Luther Seminary um, and a uh, D-Men, uh, M.A., and a B.A. from Abilene Christian University, and an M.Div. from Pepperdine University. Mark and Donna live in Rochester, Michigan, 
which is very close to my hometown. Um, Mark relaxes by playing his guitar, working out, and watching sports. He's learning to love the Red Wings hockey. Um, Mark has three daughters, Stacy, Brenda, Cassie, and one son, Josh. Mark has three granddaughters, Autumn, Maya, and Clara. And with that, we welcome Dr. Greg Marutsky and Dr. Mark Love uh, to our Zoom meeting. Thank you for for coming, guys. Um, one of the things I just, just as an introduction, I, I wanted to say, you know, at, at Common Grounds Unity, we're seeking to provide an environment that strengthens and develops relationships across the various streams of the Stone Campbell movement. So I'm really excited to have Greg and Mark with us today because they are an example of how strong relationships can lead to cooperation and consequently greatly benefit the Lord's church. So I'll let them share more, but in short, the Masters of Religious Education program at Rochester University is bringing the Church of Christ and the ICOC students together in a cohort learning environment. Um, so uh, we're very excited to have them and, and we're gonna do like a, a question answer uh, session. I'm gonna ask a question, I'll get out of the way. And at the end of um, each of the questions, the first two questions, uh, Javier is going to uh, take, if you, if you just put in your, if you have a question that you'd like to put in the chat, put it in there and Javier will ask that question and, uh, and then we'll move on to the next one. And then after the third question, we'll open it up for a, a open q and I'll unmute everybody and uh, we can do that, so. Um, with that, welcome Dr. Greg Moretzky and Dr. Mark Love. Thank you for being with us. And um, so my first question I'd like to start off with is, could you talk to us about your relationship and friendship and how this program, the, M the MRE Missional Leadership Program developed? Go ahead, Greg. Oh, okay. Well, uh, Mark and I, got acquainted in his parents' living room in the late 90s. I was in their, his parents' class on marriage in the modern world. And Mark was visiting them. And Stuart was my advisor. And uh, while I was getting my, going to Pepperdine, and Diesta was my classmate. We got our Masters of Divinity together. And... Uh, Stuart just uh, sort of adopted me. He mentored me. I, I was going through a, uh, some theological and spiritual fragmentation <laughs> while I was at Pepperdine, as many uh, graduate students do, reconciling what they have known with what they're learning and how to do ministry. And Stuart was a tremendous confidant, friend, spiritual father, mentor and Diesta was just a friend but also a spiritual mother and uh, so Stuart had a great impact on my life he taught me that theology has got to precede ministry and I've never forgotten that and then uh, and many of his classes I just had to fight back tears being so inspired by him and then I got to process them with my thoughts with his wife at our breaks so I already fell in love with the loves, which is, a, you know, funny, a quip. And uh, then uh, I, when I went to Pepper, uh, to Abilene, Mark's classes on practical theology, on evangelism, on culture, just inspired and changed my life. I was, again, moved and had to fight breaking down emotionally in class, even though I am usually a very emotionally stable person, because it just was so in-depth, so inspiring, so uh, necessary to fill in some of my gaps in uh, knowledge. And so that's where our, our friendship really began in my doctor of ministry about uh, 15 years ago with Mark and then we worked together on the Abilene Christian uh, conversations between the ICOC and the, uh, the Church of Christ 
and I'll let Mark take it from there. All right. Should we vote on whether or not Greg's emotionally stable most of the time? <laughs> uh, um, that may be the most controversial thing said today. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Greg is um, one of my dearest friends, and it began at ACU. It uh, probably deepened um, in 2004 when uh, I was the Bible Lectures Director at ACU. And we hosted a conversation between um, ICOC members and COC members, uh, people who had been parts of both movements and had interacted deeply through the years. And uh, it was a profound and moving experience to be a part of that. And um, now, uh, frequently when I travel and show up places, there'll be people who still to this day thank me for what we did over those three days in Abilene. Um, Greg and I uh, kept track of each other um, to greater and lesser extents over the next few years. Um, and I came to Rochester 11 years ago to start a new graduate program uh, in missional leadership and um, to kind of put on the ground um, convictions I had about um, where we were um, as a culture and as a church in relationship to all that and to prepare leaders for the moment we're in in different ways than um, I had been experiencing before then. And so we've been at it now for a while. We'll be in our 12th year in that degree. And uh, about four years ago, uh, Greg and I began to have conversations about whether or not it'd be possible for there to be ICOC cohorts in our program. And uh, we've had one graduate now, we'll have another one graduate in two weeks. Um, over 20 students in those two groups. We've got a cohort of eight that's finishing their first year. And we'll start with a cohort of, I'm hoping, 12 um, in just a few weeks. So um, uh, that has been one of the real blessings of my life, is getting to know people like Raphael and Cesar and others who have come through our program. Uh, I have a lot of preconceived notions um, about what that would be like. Um, I felt like maybe there be the possibility of kind of uh, defensiveness around cherished beliefs and ideas and practices and that I'd have to tread uh, maybe uh, softly in certain areas and certain places. <clears throat> Uh, but I'm glad Raphael's here because he was the first guy to really tell me, um, uh, take the kid gloves off. We're grownups. Uh, we can do this. And um, I have found not only uh, non-defensiveness in learning, but uh, really eager, open hearts and minds 
And uh, my good friend Richard Beck teaches uh, in our program. Uh, he gives two days in Durham, North Carolina. It's a great, great uh, week with students. And after Raphael's cohort, Richard pulled me aside and said, this is the best cohort you've ever had. So, uh, you know, that was nine, 10 years in. And uh, so they've been uh, great students. Um, they care passionately about what they're learning. Um, they're eager for new learning. It's just been a, a delight. And uh, none of this would have been possible without Greg. Um, you know, Greg put me in front of the right people um, to get it off the ground. Uh, Greg believes deeply in the program. He uh, has attended every course. He's come to every uh, cohort face-to-face -face except one. Um, and... Uh, and he's my main recruiter, you know, he gives me names. And so um, Andy's raised money and uh, put a little bingo gambling money toward our enterprise. Uh, so uh, it's just uh, another chapter in the rich warm relationship that Greg and I have. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing, guys. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the MRE Missional Leadership Program and its approach, how, how it all works? Yeah, I'll start, Greg, and then you, you can uh, um, Tell everyone what you've noticed in terms of distinctiveness. We think we bring four things together in a unique way. First is our emphasis on missional leadership. So the word missional to us indicates that we're not in Kansas anymore, <clears throat> that Churches are doing everything they know to do better than they've ever done it before with diminishing impact. And it's not because they're incompetent. It's because we've had major cultural change. And so uh, the church needs to um, recognize that. And we need leaders who are less chaplains and more apostolic leaders who are reading cultures and interpreting their context and understanding their lives, not in relation to the mission of the church, but in relation to the mission of God. So that's number one. Number two is um, we, we've been trying to get away from moving from theory to practice. So uh, we call our degree a situated learning degree. You have to be in the context to do our degree. You have to have permissions to do projects in your context to do our degree. So every course has a portfolio project that begins in the congregation, then we move that experience through the reflection of lectures and reading, and we try to say something meaningful about what we've learned on the other side of that. So we're not moving from theory to practice. Uh, I quibble with my dad a little bit there that uh, theology always precedes ministry. Um, but we also think that um, context is uh, generative. It's where God is active. And so learning to pay attention to context is really important. I'm talking way too much here. Third 
is um, we believe in uh, spiritual formation as the number one commitment uh, to our students and our degree. We keep a cohort rule of life uh, that uh, our groups commit to and personalize. And then we provide a spiritual director who um, meets with our students regularly, uh, meets with the cohort regularly and uh, provides uh, direction and coaching related to the rule of life, all for the sake of a God-centered identity. And I, I don't know of another program that does it to the extent that we do it. You don't take class on spiritual formation. It's built into everything we do. And then the fourth thing is the cohort. Um, you take the same 12 courses with the same 10 to 12 people. Uh, one of our recent grads said there's no wasted space in the program. Everything builds on itself. And uh, we, I think, create a, a rich and unique learning community. Um, so those are kind of the four distinctives of our program. And we think we've pulled them together in a unique way. What do you notice, Greg? Well, the reason I, I'm a recruiter for the program is, is basically the blending of the Church of Christ and the ICOC. The Church of Christ has so many strengths and one of them is this in-depth biblical studies, theological education. And, you know, there are just the older brother to uh, the ICOC. And so they're further down the road. They've learned many of the lessons that we're learning, we, we're, we're having to learn. And we've got to a place where we plateaued. You know, we have our strengths, but one of our weaknesses was leadership and, and uh, a hierarchy system. And so the missional leadership degree really helps cure uh, our fellowship of some of uh, our tendencies that uh, we needed to grow in. And so I, I'm just so thankful for uh, Mark's risk in taking just an ICOC cohort and, and uh, letting us you know, into the program. And, and I, and I, I met with uh, Brian Stogner, the president, Dr. Stogner, and, and uh, he sort of quizzed me because it was a risk for their school in some ways uh, with our reputation in the past in uh, higher education in the, in the, in the fellowship. And so, uh, but it, it, this has all been providential. Uh, one of our members looked up researched all the programs on leadership and missional uh, idea around the country. And he chose Rochester and he came to me and asked me what I thought about it. And I said, well, I would go there. That's where my friend Mark, one of my best friends, Mark Love, is the, the, the dean. And so one of our members, Frank Friedel, went through before we started the cohorts and just sort of led the way, I think, in, uh, um, we, we owe a lot to Frank. But anyway, uh, Dr. Stogner, at the end of our interview, said, uh, well, you know, Greg, uh, I just asked myself, what would Jesus do? And I think Jesus would uh, want to help train anybody that came to our school and wanted to become more proficient in ministry. And my best friend uh, left the Detroit area and went to Cape Town, South Africa, and there, there wasn't at that time a, a Church of Christ for him to go to. So he went to the International Church of Christ and was there for several years. And he just loved it. And now he's come back and we're implementing things that he learned and, and grew in. And uh, so that's my only experience. I've heard a lot of stories about you guys, but the only person I know that firsthand was him. So let's do this. And I stay up with Dr. Stogner and he's very pleased with our students and the program. But I, 
I share that story because there are risks involved in common ground. There are risks in these relationships and you have to overcome some of the preconceived ideas. I grew up in the Church of Christ, so I have more of an affinity and love. It's part of my identity. My brother, older brother, is an elder and song leader. And my mother is turned 90 yesterday, and the Church of Christ has saved her soul. And consequently, I'm a ripple effect of that. And so I see us as one fellowship, one brotherhood. I, I've even applied to Pepperdine as both Church of Christ and International Church of Christ. So we are of the same family. We have, we're, we, we have a little different flavors, tastes, and, but they complement each other. And uh, this program, not one of the ministers that have participated in it has been critical at all. They have loved it. They have been so grateful that they're in the program and learning and it's helping them to, to move forward in their ministries and be more effective. And so uh, it's, it's a great marriage. And I'm going to say made in heaven because God made it happen through Frank and, and Mark and I and Dr. Stogner, our lives sort of uh, intersecting. So. Yeah, Amen. it's hard not to... Um, tell the the story of mine and Greg's relationship over the years and not feel strongly that God has been at work. Amen. And that's really what it's all about, huh? Just coming together. You know, both of you have um, mentioned this, this concept of preconceived notions uh, going into this. And my, my question is, is can you, can you talk a little bit more about that these preconceived notions that you had um how did that play out what what did you learn from it go ahead mark <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've already uh named one um so um um Um, I don't know how the best way in is, but I'll just say that um, I never grew up and have been surprised over the years to find sectarian expressions of churches of Christ. I know that's shocking to some of you, but I grew up hearing my dad preach. And so I never heard, you know, the we're the only ones and, uh, you know, um, I, I just didn't know any of that existed. And one of the things that came out of the 2004 conversation was that clearly, um, you know, uh, I wasn't totally thought of as uh, being a part of God's kingdom. Um, and um, even though I knew uh, that Greg considered me a dear brother and I'd experienced that with other people, I just kind of had... Um, suspicions that the sectarianism that has been a part of both of our movements would express itself academically in kind of a uh, defensiveness. And um, boy, again, that just turned out to be totally wrong. Um, I was just wrong about that. Um, we have probably about half of our students um, are Church of Christ. Um, and um, then we have another large group of uh, kind of evangelical students. And of the kind of three groups I'm describing, 
the evangelical students are by far the most defensive and the ones who have uh, the most <clears throat> turf to protect. Um, and I thought that might be uh, a little bit of the story with the ICUC, but just the opposite has been true. So I got a drink here, Greg. Sure. Well, I think our preconceived notions were <clears throat> that higher uh, biblical studies, higher education in biblical studies wasn't necessary. And, you know, okay, Greg, you can go do that because you started a degree years ago in Abilene and you're turning 40 and want to finish. So, okay, we'll let you do that. And, uh, and then the other one at that time, I don't believe this at all, but it was a question in the back of my mind is just how useful will this information be? And are these people living it out or is it just knowledge? And that was a preconceived question. And uh, in my experience at, at Pepperdine Abilene and in and, and all the fellowship I've had in Rochester, you know, the people that I've uh, interacted with are call me higher spiritually, are as committed to the Lordship of Jesus as anybody I know, love people and are, are uh, evangelistic and, and are letting themselves be spiritually formed as, as disciples of Jesus as much as uh, any of anybody in our ICOC fellowship and the education I've got plus the relationships have been invaluable to me as a minister. I wouldn't have lasted in ministry for 40 years. Uh, I, I'm the last of my generation of friends. About 20 of us went into the ministry at the same time and, and uh, I'm the only one left. And People got out for different reasons, but I feel like what's fueled me is this uh, relationship I've had with the Church of Christ uh, schools and brothers and sisters that I've gone to school with. And uh, it's it just fed my soul and fed my spirit. And I was wrong in, in not realizing how much I would get from it. And... Uh, my, my, my best friends are not just in the ICOC. My best friends are of, of many stripes and tribes, but uh, uh, definitely some of my very best friends are Church of Christ. Very good. Thanks, guys. So we're going to open it up here for uh, some Q&A. Uh, I think Javier had a question that somebody asked privately. Uh, so go ahead, Javier. And then uh, if you want to just chime in and ask a question, unmute yourself. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand or anything, but just uh, chime in and uh, ask the question. So, Javier. Okay, thank you. I received a question um, that wants to be asked anonymously. One thing that the ICOC was effective in the past was a strong commitment to evangelism. How does the program address and train in evangelism and how have the graduates experienced growth in their congregations? Um, <clears throat> great question. Um, I've told um, ICOC students that um, one of your great gifts is your commitment to evangelism and um, I don't want anything in our program to diminish that one bit. Um, and I think I've lived up to that. Um, uh, but I might want to change the categories a little bit. Think about um, uh, terms like gospel and cultures and um, and uh, paint a Trinitarian 
picture of God in the world, not just a Christological picture of God in the world. And my conviction uh, related to that is that the richer that picture is painted and lived into, uh, the more um, contagious your belief will be. And I think that um, we've tended to be um, not, not just ICOC, but our tribe as well, have um, tended to be maybe a little um, militaristic in our metaphors related to evangelism. We're expanding the kingdom. We're um, winning souls. We're, um, but I made a presentation at the, the uh, teacher's thing in San Antonio last March. The last thing I did as a free person not living in my basement uh, was <laughs> to go to San Antonio and do that. But I think the missional impulse um, doesn't do anything to weaken evangelistic fervor, but can give it uh, kind of a deeper, more resonant meaning. Um, but uh, we don't teach a course in the program on any, what I would call ministry arts. We don't teach a preaching course. We don't teach a counseling course or a youth ministry course because we think the uh, leading skill in ministry in general and in a new missional era in particular is the ability to interpret our context well and out of that then to respond faithfully to what we encounter instead of tried and true we want to interpret and respond. And so uh, I'll let Raf and uh, Cesar say what they want to about it, but that's kind of been our approach. Yeah, I, I think I'll jump in. Um, just, just to begin the program, the Rochester uh, Missional Leadership degree for me was the best thing that I have ever done for my spiritual walk. Uh, aside from just leadership and aside from uh, training and learning, the best thing I have ever done for my spiritual walk. Uh, you know, there's a big difference between a commitment to evangelism and an effective, effectiveness in evangelism. I think that there is a commitment and a desire, but we're all bumping against the same uh, problem. We're all bumping against the, the issue of how do we reach the world today uh, that is so vastly different from what it was even 20 years ago. And if we're using the same type of methods and methodology and, and even deeper than that perspective, then we're going to keep bumping into that. Uh, the missional leadership degree is very much not just along the lines of us committing in evangelism, but enriching it. Uh, the, the, the fact that the Father sent the Son and the Father's Son sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit precedes the church and mission is 100% along the line of what we want to have every Christian uh, understand and, and, and be educated by in their evangelism. Uh, in, here uh, in our ministry in Los Angeles, my wife and I uh, lead a ministry called the Lifeway Church. It's one of the uh, nine now regions in Los Angeles. And uh, we had the distinct uniqueness that we had two very mature, long-term couples in our ministry, along with, you know, some that were kind of in the middle and a, a number that were younger. Uh, the Fiques and the Neelands, which some of you might know. And every single project that we had for our program, I did with our ministry staff. So you could, I mean, my wife can actually share with you how it was embodied. We had... Just if you want to just look at effectiveness, we had two of our best ministry years we've ever had. Uh, and it was all based on us being able to discover where the spirit is leading. So I think a deeper uh, 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 understanding theologically of the Trinity, a deeper understanding of pneumatology, 
all those things, you know, understanding uh, our role in mission, not as going out there as the savior of people, but that we are presenting the savior and we are joining into God's work uh, and kind of getting away from the hero model leadership. And I think that's where a lot of leadership kind of keeps bumping its head against the wall because you sort of figured, I just got to work harder. I got to do more. I got to, you know, study more. And, and we're all full of guilt because we're not as, 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 as active or productive as we were in our, you know, 20s and 30s. And so we're just wondering how that works. But I, I think letting go and understanding the Spirit's work is something that can propel a mission. And so for us, this year has been a transitional year. Those two couples actually have retired that's part even of the missional work. They actually have adopted a leadership of the spirit in their own lives that enabled them to allow space for the church to move forward, uh, which, you know, sometimes in leadership, people tend to hang on way too long. So there's, there's just so much there. I, you know, mm -hmm. it, there's so much of our ministry was enriched because of this program. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because, um, I thought I was the only one, Greg. I know you were trying too. There's not been a week that has gone by what I've learned and what have I experienced that does not produce any tears. And I would have to say those tears come from um, a perspective of, you know, coming into the program, I've served on the mission field for about 20 years, um, mostly in the third world. So coming back to America, it's sort of like what um, Newbigin felt. What happened? happened to UK after serving so many years in India? What happened to America? And I really, I, there was a lot of processing and healing that needed to go on. And I would have to say that this program, the relationships, um, Greg and Mark and my cohort, I don't know honestly where I'd be. I really don't. If, if I had not had the opportunity to experience what I've learned and what I've learned so far in respect to the question you know, it's to add on what Raphael shared, it's like for growth. It's it's redefining growth. You know, I think in our tradition, we have always um, categorized what growth is. And uh, I've learned through what we've learned so far is that the um, the spirit of God is 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 doing a lot already. And how do we engage in that? And that's been um, refreshing to me because it allowed me to look at my tradition and uh, look at the things that we could have done better or we did wrong, but to preserve it and to respect it and to understand. But then also the opportunity to learn and discover new treasures. And I could say that because uh, that's refreshing because the best is ahead. And what's in before me is how do we, how do we engage the next generation? How do we how do we pass on? And that's the part that's been renewing for me is now that there's hope because it's not so much learning and applying new practices, but becoming more. So um, the God Center identity is huge. The understanding the Trinitarian um, component, but what does it really mean to build a, a missional communities in the spirit of the cross? So. Um, that's been uh, very life-giving to me, and I can't help but express, um, again, a great deal of gratitude. I'm supposed to graduate in two weeks. I think I'm on track, Mark, you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I might send you names of people you need to encourage. Okay, no problem. You're on track. Okay, just want to make sure I'm on track. And you could add anything I say here to the points, you know, on uh, whatever yeah. you get on to. Yeah, you just got points, believe right. me. But no, really, just a, a deep gratitude to um, my big brothers, Church of Christ. Um, great gratitude to the tradition of uh, preserving the past, but also excited to look to the future. So very, very thankful and uh, highly recommended to anyone, which I have been already. I, I, I don't think John, I can you're really mute. add to that. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Uh, I'm muted. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes, several. Uh, th thank you. That was a great question that led to some very good and rich discussion. 
Uh, Nick Zola asked a question that I think was answered answered uh, because he but he wanted to hear from the students. So thank you, Cesar and Rafael, for putting in your perspectives. Um, another question from Ed Biggers is the program all in person? Maybe you can share about how COVID has impacted your program. Um, no, in fact, um, most of the program you do in your context. So um, we do two courses fully online every semester, and then we do one week face-to-face. -face. Um, and we rotate those locations where we can learn the most. So uh, we bring people to us uh, at the beginning of the program. Uh, I will travel this spring to Portland, Oregon, and to Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we also do a week in Nashville. So um, um, we call it situated learning. We think you learn best from your situation. Uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, take you out of that. And uh, so uh, we think you learn to lead by leading. And uh, so we want to coach you up where you are. So we uh, are our, our one weeks are rich, rich, rich. I'd never taken an online course. I had never taught an online course before we began this program, but uh, the, the cohort nature, the rule of life, our one week learning experiences together have created uh, uh, learning communities that I had never experienced in both the many, many, many years I went to school, number one, and uh, the, uh, my previous teaching uh, experience at Abilene, all of which were great and enriching, but this is just a different kind of experience. So the answer is no, it's not all in person. Only one week a semester is, uh, but uh, we've figured out a little of the secret sauce in terms of making online, uh, the online platform good and meaningful and cohort. And I wouldn't go back. Uh, Greg, do you? Is there it, anything you've noticed? Yeah. Being a professional student still in school and now an online program, the one-week residencies create such bonding and, and connection that uh, I miss it in my program. And, and I, I never preferred online and, and did some in previous schooling at the University of Nebraska. And this, this is just a little bit close. It's just closer. It's more intimate. When you get a week together, uh, learning and having fun and living together, it, it starts a bond and then it gets built the other uh, three semesters. And uh, it just, it really is rich. I like the combination. And uh, at this, it, it, when you're in full-time ministry, online is really a great way to go. So but it needs that residency. Amen. So unmute yourself. We have time for a couple more questions. You want to ask? This is Ed Biggers. Greg, uh, were you at Lancaster when the church started, the ICOC church started there? Uh, no, I had friends. Uh, Dr. Jerry Sugarman, I, I knew, and I knew George Grima. And uh, now I have a great friend, Mike Benowitz, is part of was a part of the Lancaster Church back then. Uh, no, I I was in the Boulder Church, and then uh, many different places. I've been here five years, and uh, 
uh, I, it connects me to Los Angeles, but also gives me a little uh, bit uh, of distance. Uh, I like the altitude here. I like the high desert. <laughs> and I love the church. The reason I ask was my brother was one of the elders at the Lancaster Church oh. when the when the split occurred. <laughs> and, oh, okay. And so then when he uh, understood that I was currently attending an ICOC church, he said, well, they're not interested in older people. They only want young people there. <laughs> and so they won't pay any attention to you. So I told him, no, that's not the way it is anymore. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, you know, I have had a totally different experience than my brother did. So. Well, one of the kids that were con was converted there, Dean uh, Wilson, uh, he was an intern with me at MIT, and he was one of those early converts in the Lancaster Church. And and uh, the the ICOC people have great affection now for the for the Lancaster Church. We've done joint worship joint uh, worship services and things like that. We have a good relationship. Good. Yeah. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Um, anybody else have a question? I'll jump in there. I just was curious for uh, Dr. Love and Greg, perhaps, or really anyone, but do you feel like the COVID uh, pandemic will change churches as we operate for the long term? Or you think it's, uh, how do you feel like it's best to adapt, you know, in this environment, if it is a long-term change? Yeah, great question, Mike. Um, well, I think that um, the answer is, I'm not sure how, but it absolutely will. Um, and um, I don't think churches should be eager to return to normal. Um, and one of the things we teach in our program is to ask different kinds of uh, reflective questions. We don't want to just ask, did it work? Uh, we want to ask, uh, what, what did we learn? Uh, but the other question is, um, what surprised us? And that question's important to us because um, it, it bears the possibility that we might see something we would have missed if we assumed that the world that we live in is the world God wants for us. You know, if we equate our vision with the world, with God's vision for the world, then the Bible calls that idolatry. And so uh, it's the surprise, the thing we couldn't account for, that oftentimes is kind of the crack in the way things have always been done that allows us to glimpse the possibility of something new. And we don't think you can get to missional apart from the something new, apart from adaptive change. And so we hope that COVID will be uh, enough of an interruption to business as usual for us to ask the question, what what's the new thing God might be calling us to out of this experience? So um, I don't know exactly what those lessons will be, Mike, but um, I don't think we should rush back to normal, but rather should sit a little longer where we are and ask what the living God might be up to. Amen. Well, with that, we've run out of time. We really appreciate you both. Um, I'm going to ask, um, let me just pick somebody here. Uh, Sean, would you be willing to close us out in a prayer? Sure, I can do that. And um, just uh, if you want to hang on, so afterwards, if you want to get off, uh, 
you can get off. But if you want to hang on for another five to ten minutes, uh, I'll leave it open so you guys can chit chat. But we'll close out it uh, after the prayer, and then if you want to stick around and have a little chat, we'll leave it open for that. So, thanks for closing us out. All right, Father, we just praise you for this example of unity within our our brotherhood and. We truly want to be obedient to Christ's prayer. And God, I know that we're always, I remember a saying uh, by someone that talked about love and truth are two sides, two banks to, to the river of, of, of Christianity. And if you emphasize one without the other, there's destruction. So we need truth, we need love to balance out this, this flow of evangelism, uh, growth as, as, as a movement. Uh, and God, we want to see people saved, and we know because uh, of Jesus' promise that more will be saved when we uh, live together in harmony and unity and work together. So we just pray for your continued blessing upon uh, brotherhood, these movements. And even as we um, dream and uh, about how you might use us um, even beyond our brotherhood and partnerships with, with others, and again, always resting that balance of love and truth, all for the goal of reaching the lost, God. We ask that you would help us to believe in the power of your word, and believe in the presence of the Holy Spirit within each believer in each church, God. And um, so we just ask that we could also claim that promise that Jesus gave that he is the one who builds the church. And we just get to be a part of it. And we thank you for that privilege, God. Encourage us with that, that truth and that vision. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Mark and Greg. And we'll um, we'll just leave it open here. If you guys want to chat or if you have extra questions, feel free. If you need to go, feel free to go as well. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody.